Hello, and welcome to this film, which is about standard reduction potentials. Um, it's another film about redox chemistry, but now that we've finished dealing with equation writing and stoichiometry, we're now moving on to a more practical aspect of the course. And hopefully by the end of this film, you'll understand, um, well, where the standard reduction potentials are and what they tell you, and also what a standard hydrogen electrode is. And ideally, by the end of this film, you'll be able to look at a standard reduction potential for a certain substance and decide how good an oxidizing agent or reducing agent that substance is by looking at that number that you've looked up. Okay, so first of all, it's worth pointing out that these are not things that you have to commit to memory. Okay, you'll be given a list of these on your data sheet. Um, this one that I've cut and pasted here was just a bit easier to cut and paste than the one on your data sheet, but it's got some very important things in common with it. Okay, it's all it's got half equations written on it, lots of them, um, and we've always got the electrons on the left, so the things are always gaining electrons and turning into these things, hence they're being reduced. That's why they're called standard reduction potentials. And we've got this list of numbers here in the right-hand column. Okay, and these are the standard reduction potentials. So E standard means the standard reduction potential and it's measured in volts okay now one of the differences between this and your list on the data sheet apart from the fact that it's got some things in it which your one doesn't and your one has some things which this one doesn't is that this one shows all the half equations as being one way systems okay they're not the equilibria okay and that's really quite important um, but as I say, the list on your data sheet has double-headed arrows. That's a fairly insignificant difference in terms of what we're going to try and achieve in this film. Okay, so if we try and understand what these numbers that we can look up actually mean, let's imagine what happens if we place a strip of metal into a beaker of water. Okay, now in this diagram we've got a piece of magnesium that's been placed in water. Okay, and as magnesium dissolves, so as some of the magnesium atoms turn into magnesium 2 plus ions, they'll leave their electrons behind on the strip of metal and we'll end up with magnesium ions in solution and electrons on the strip of metal. Okay. Now eventually the rate at which the metal is dissolving will equal the rate at which ions are turning back into metal atoms. Okay. In other words this system will reach a position of equilibrium. And once it's done that, the number of electrons on this strip of metal will stop changing. Okay? So in other words, this strip of metal will become negative. Okay? And we can measure how negative it becomes. And if we look up magnesium's reduction potential, so this is a slightly condensed table, okay? but it shows once again the oxidized forms of substances gaining electrons, so being reduced, this time we've got equilibrium arrows, which makes this one a little bit better, even though it hasn't got anywhere near as much information in it. And here's the reduced form. Okay, so if I put magnesium in water, this equilibrium will be established. And if I measure how negative the strip of magnesium becomes, well, it becomes minus 2.37 volts. And if I was to swap the piece of magnesium for aluminium, then I'd measure that the piece of aluminium would become negative 2, but it would have a potential or a voltage of minus 1.66 volts. Now that means that aluminium leaves behind fewer electrons on the strip of metal than magnesium does, which means that aluminium's equilibrium lies, lies further to the right than that for magnesium. In other words, magnesium is better at giving up electrons or going left than aluminium is. And zinc, with, an electrode, uh, with a reduction potential of minus 0.76 volts, isn't as good as either of them. So in other words, zinc isn't as good at dissolving and turning into ions and giving up electrons as aluminium or magnesium are. Okay. Now, all metals will leave behind electrons. But you can see that copper here has a positive reduction potential. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that copper leaves behind no electrons on the, on the strip of metal or that it takes electrons away from that strip of metal. All it means is, is that it's m less negative than any of these ones above it. But how come it's got a positive value? Now to understand that, we've got to know what a standard hydrogen electrode is. 
Some people call this a standard reference electrode because it provides a reference point for all these other potentials. Okay, now it's quite a difficult electrode to set up, but it is the standard, so there we are. And the way to construct it, and this is something that's important to know, okay, is that you have hydrogen gas, okay, hydrogen gas at one atmosphere pressure being bubbled down over a platinum gauze, okay, through a solution of H plus ions whose concentration is one mole per litre. In other words, we're setting up this equilibrium with H plus ions gaining electrons, so being reduced, and turning into hydrogen. Okay? H2. And the fact that this is our standard reference electrode means that we define it as having a voltage of zero volts. Now this doesn't mean that hydrogen leaves no electrons behind on this strip of platinum. Okay? It just means that we're going to refer to it as having a voltage of zero volts. And because copper leaves fewer electrons behind on the, elect on the strip of metal than hydrogen does, it can have a more positive electrode potential or reduction potential than hydrogen does. Okay? Because copper was whatever it was, plus 0.36 volts, I think. Okay? Not, not important if I've got that wrong. Okay? Because you can look it up. Right? But um, this means that hydrogen gives up more electrons than copper does because it's more negative than copper is. Or you could say that copper gives up fewer electrons than hydrogen does because it's more positive. Now then, how do we use one of these standard reference electrodes? Well, we have to make a circuit with it. Okay? So what we do is we take our standard hydrogen electrode, which is here. Okay? We connect it using a wire to our strip of metal. Okay, we put a voltmeter in here so that we can measure the potential here, right? And we have to complete this circuit, but we have to complete it in such a way that we don't add any other strips of metal because they'll set up their own potentials, okay? So we actually connect this, these two half cells, as they're called, and we'll look at this in more detail later, with something called a salt bridge. And what that's made out of is something, as I say, for a bit later. If this is going to be a standard reduction potential that we're measuring, we have to do it at one mole per litre. And as you can see on your data sheet, these things are measured at 25 degrees centigrade. Okay? So a standard reduction potential can be defined as the potential of a half cell when it's connected to a standard hydrogen electrode and the hydrogen is at one atmosphere and the H plus ions are one mole per litre, and the metal ions are one mole per litre in this solution, and we've got the metal here. Okay? So this is how we measure one of these standard reduction potentials. We just connect our electrode that we're making by putting a strip of metal in a solution of metal ions, reaching its equilibrium, and finding out how negative or how many electrons there are compared to the hydrogen electrode, which we're going to define as being zero. Okay, now then, if we go back to our data sheet and our list of reduction potentials, we can see what these numbers are going to tell us about the oxidizing strength of a substance. Okay, well, if fluorine has a standard reduction potential of 2.87, that means it's more positive than any of the other reduction potentials in this list. Right? So in other words, fluorine lies the least over to the side with electrons. It's the worst at giving up electrons of any of these substances. Okay? If it's not good at giving up electrons, it must be very good at taking them. So in other words, this equilibrium here, which is unfortunately shown with one-way arrow here, this equilibrium must lie a long way over to the right compared to any of these others. So in other words, fluorine is very good at taking electrons away from things and turning into fluoride ions. It's a very strong oxi oxidizing agent. Likewise, fluoride ions, because they're very bad at giving up electrons and reducing other things, 
are very weak reducing agents. Okay, if we go down to the bottom of the list and look at the substances with the most negative electrode potentials, so that is the ones whose equilibrium lies furthest over to the right where these electrons are, we can see on our data sheet it's actually potassium at the bottom of the list, but here we've got lithium. Okay, lithium is more negative than any of these above it, so its equilibrium lies more over to the left than any of the others, which means that lithium is excellent at giving up electrons or giving electrons to things or reducing them. So lithium is a very strong reducing agent. But lithium ions, because they're not very good at accepting electrons and turning into lithium, are very weak oxidizing agents. Okay? Now, it's not really all that important that you can explain that in a test, right? But it is important that you can look at your data sheet and remember that the things that are in the top left corner are very strong oxidizing agents, right? Whilst the things that are in the bottom right hand corner are very strong reducing agents, right? So, anyway, that basically covers what we mean by reduction potentials and how we measure them, all right? Um, it can be quite a confusing topic, um, and it would be great if there's any questions that you've got upon watching this film, if you ask them as soon as you po if possibly can, whether that's by posting a comment, which I'd love you to do, or by coming to ask me a question in class, which I'd love you to do just as much, um, really. Um, do one or the other. Make sure that any areas of confusion are cleared up before you move on.